Good morning, Earthlings. How you doing today? Welcome to First Contact Radio. Glad you could be here today. Let's check out our cosmic weather, see what we're dealing with for today. All right, over here at uh, SolarWindSpaceWeather.com, start off solar wind is 316.9 kilometers per second. Planetary K index is at a zero. Could get up to a one, which is very low. Coronal holes, we could see we still have this one here in the making. And that certainly does look to have some sort of geometric shape to it. Triangular, perhaps. Okay. What's going on there? Um, chance for flares are very low. 10% chance of an N-class flare. Geomagnetic storm activity very low as well. Moving along to our astrology for today. We're right here. So what we've got is... The elements we're working with are the conscious mind element is air, Aquarius, unconscious mind element, air, Gemini. So we've got a double air day, a double air day. So what that means, air, is an element that represents words and actions. It's activity. Think of how air is. Air moves. Air doesn't stay still. So when there's air, there's movement. So we've got the air on the conscious mind and the air on the unconscious. So expect a lot of movement today in terms of communication and the things that people are saying and the actions people are doing. Expect to see a lot of that type of activity around you today as people are working to understand these ways to communicate. Now Gemini, which is the moon sign, is all about communication. The air sign, which is the conscious mind, it's about balanced communication within oneself because it's learning how to step with one land one foot on the unconscious, one on the conscious. So there's a balancing act that takes place within the the being itself. And so as we learn to balance out consciously the energies we're working with and unconsciously, we're then able to find a way to make the two balance together. So there's continual balancing acts going on because everything is about energy. So that's what we're working with today, air and air. Okay? Moving from there, our moon phase, we're making our way up to that full moon. We'll be there in just a couple of days. On the Mayan Oracle, we're at a five-tone day. It's the wave spell of the eagle, so it's the vision. So it's the fifth position in the wave spell of vision. It's called the overtone storm. That's our guide or the kin for today. The guide for today is the hand, which is all about accomplishment. Think of the hand. You can use your hands to kill. Or to heal, to destroy, or to create. Depends on what you want to use your hands to do. And that's the free will choice that we have each and every day. The phrase for today is, I empower in order to catalyze commanding energy. I seal the matrix of self-generation with the overtone, tone of radiance. I am guided by the power of accomplishment. And today is a galactic activation portal day. And the reason is because, as you can see right here, we are two columns over, two positions up. So because we're in this position here, this is where the energy is intensifying or meeting together from the columns and the rows. So that's why it's a galactic activation portal day. Okay, It's one of these days where things are a little bit more intense because of the way the energy is intersecting with each other. There you have it. That's our cosmic weather for today. Okay, so the very first piece I want to get to is it's an interview it's a four-part interview with Dolores Cannon I'm gonna play the first part today but Dolores Cannon as you may know is is a regression therapist um, she's done a lot of work with a lot of clients and has had uh, information come through from a variety of different sources and working with her clients anything from extraterrestrial to Nostradamus She's written several books. Anyway, you've heard plenty of her information on this show. This is a really good interview. I wanted to play this for you. So here we go. 
It's been nearly five years since we've seen Dolores Cannon, and we wanted to catch up on the new messages coming through her thousands of hypnotherapy clients regarding the changes that are in motion for humanity, specifically our evolution as a species. What she's being told is that we have two distinctly different outcomes ahead, depending on how we choose to develop our own vibrations. It was so good catching up with you again because the story and the work you've done has progressed quite a lot in the last few years. You have some new books out. You've regressed many, many more people. And what I love about what you're doing is this, this mosaic of individual experiences that is creating a larger picture of where we're headed as a species and where the earth has headed itself. And Dolores, what I'd like to start with is this whole notion of first the volunteer souls that have come for this time and then start working through the wave one, two, and three people that have been born their jobs and, and how they're executing it and what their source is. Okay, because since we worked together, I've done a lot more work and gone into a whole different direction than I was before. And a lot of it is focusing on the new earth that we're moving into in these times right now with the changing of the vibrations and the frequencies, that everything is different. This is a very exciting time to be alive. But that's one thing that people want me to talk about is the three waves of volunteers. We get thousands of emails now since I've done Coast to Coast and Project Camelot saying, I know I am first wave, I am second wave. They're identifying with it because they said for the first time it makes sense to them. Their whole life they have felt something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And now it begins to make sense as we start giving the, uh, what do I want to call, not the symptoms, but the characteristics of the three waves. But to know about the three waves, I'm not going to have time to go back to the whole beginning. No. But it has to do with the ETs and the way they have watched over the earth since it was created, because they're the ones that created us. And... Uh, the seeding of the planet Earth, and they've been there all through Earth's history watching us and taking care of us. And whenever something was needed in our timeline, they would supply it. Like whenever we needed fire, learned about fire, we learned about agriculture, all of this was brought in at those times. And every time something is supposed to be in our timeline, a new invention or something, they help it to get here. And in the old days, they were thought of as gods and goddesses because they lived among the people to teach them what they were supposed to do. Now they can't do it. So that whenever something is needed, a new idea, a new invention, it has to be in our timeline, it is put into the atmosphere. And then whoever invents it gets it. They don't care who does. And you know, there are many people all over the world working on the same invention at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, this was going along rather smoothly because they said uh, a lot of times they would give us something and we turn around and use it for the wrong reason. And you've got to remember, this was a planet. They said, give this beautiful planet a creature with intelligence and free will and see what they do with it. Yes. So that's what they've been allowing us to do these the things. The grand experiment. And the prime directive is the one on Star Trek of non-interference. You cannot interfere with the development of a, of a civilization. So they've been watching us and observing us. And every time they would give us something, we turn it into a weapon or something like that. And I asked them one time, isn't that interference to give us um, fire, give us agriculture? And they said, no, because that is a gift. We give you at one time at your point of development. And then what you do with it is free will. And as we turn it around and use it negative, that's our free will to do that. And I said, well, can't you come back and tell them they're doing it wrong? They said, no, because that is interference. And that's what's not allowed. So this brings us up to the three waves. Because at the end of World War II, when we dropped the atomic bomb, really got their attention. And if you remember, at the end of World War II is when the big UFO flap began. Yes. And we began and then seeing... the response to it in 1947, Project Blue Book, all these different all responses. All of it started at the end of the yes, war. Yes, NSA. Because uh, they were observing up until then, you know, shaking their heads, here we go through this awful World War II. <clears throat> 
But it was like we still had to let us keep doing what we were doing. But then we dropped the atomic bomb, and they got down here. They said, we better see what these kids are up to, because they should not have had this power yet. It was not supposed to be given to us until we could use it in the right way. It was supposed to be used positive. Instead, it was invented, it was invented as negative for a weapon. And it will never have the energy it was supposed to have because of that. It was yeah. supposed to be positive. Well, could a positive use have been the proper use of it for <clears throat> an energy supply, for example, for nuclear energy That's supplies what it was around supposed the planet? To be. Yes. But we weren't ready yet to have it because they knew what we would do with it. Mm -hmm. So we got it too soon. So that's what they were worried about. Now, with the Prime Directive, the only time they can really interfere with a civilization is if it gets to the point that we're going to blow up the world. If that happens, they would have to step in. Because if we were to blow up the world, it would send reverberations, not only through our planet, but through the whole solar system, through the galaxies, and through the universes. And it would cause tremendous damage. So you would think one little planet over here isolated in this part of the solar system wouldn't be important. But we have a multidimensional Earth, which it would have also <coughs> impacted the other... It, please take a drink. It would have also impacted the other dimensions yes. of Earth. They and said we don't that also. stop to think about that. Yes. So the reverberations would have been <coughs> felt wide and far if we had they succeeded said in this. It would be as though undeclared war on the other dimensions. Yes. Where there are other civilizations are existing. So if something like that happened, they would have to come in and stop it. That's the only way they could. So when the atomic war began, the atomic bomb began. They were really upset about it because these kids are not going to know how to handle this. And they could very well blow up the world with it because they don't know what to do with it. So there are councils that are over all of these things. There are rules and regulations. Nothing is it's just by happenstance. Everything has rules and regulations that are put on it. So they go back to the council and they're telling them, Oh, we don't know what we're going to do. We can't interfere. So it's like, what are we going to do? They couldn't just come in and say, stop this, because that's interference. So they said they had a meeting with the council. And it was like, um, we know we can't interfere from the outside. They came up with this plan that I consider to be brilliant. They said, what if we influence from the inside? So that was when they made the call, went out for volunteers of, to come and help Earth. So this would have been late 40s, early 50s yes. then, that the first this wave... This is where I tried to put dates and years on the three waves. Mm -hmm. My daughter says I might be a little too strict on it, because some people tell me they think they are overlapping the ages that I've come up mm -hmm. with. But it says, to, to, to send out for volunteers, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Pure souls that have never been to Earth before have never been contaminated. See, most of Earth, the souls of Earth, are contaminated with karma. Many lives, af many one after the other after the other, contaminating with karma, have to repeat it again and again, and we're still not working not it out. Not learning. We're caught on the wheel of karma. Mm -hmm. so they said they knew we weren't going to be able to do it. We just come through this horrible war. We couldn't take care of ourselves. We can't take care of our own lives because of the repeating of karma. We couldn't do it. So the volunteers were asked to come who had never been on Earth before, never been in a human body. They were not contaminated. They were pure souls who were asked to come. Now, in my work, none of the people I work with know this consciously. It's only found out whenever we do the sessions, it all comes out. Otherwise, they're just confused, troubled people. They don't know what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. But the first wave, the ones I call the first wave, had the most problem of all. They were the way showers, the beginners that had to come in. Now, when I do sessions now, the only time I have people going into past lives are those who have karma to be repaid. They're not going to past lives anymore. They're either going back to where they were on spaceships, they were 
you know, living on other planets, living in other dimensions, even living as light beings. They were highly evolved, and they volunteered to come and help the Earth. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk, thank you very much. This is the UFO News for today, and I have six stories for us. Story number one comes to us from Florida, Fort Myers, over Fort Myers, Florida. This was on the 8th, just last week. All right, see what we're looking at here. Take a look at this here. A little slowness going on here in the old computer today. It says on January 8th, around 10 p.m., strange bright lights appear to hover over Southwest Florida International Airport. Up to eight helicopters were witnessed surrounding the area. If anyone has any information, please contact the local MUFON. All right, let's see what is this here. Not sure what this is that's suddenly showing up here, but this is in our video on uh, here we go. All right, objects in question. Multiple lights there. Okay, links available so you can check that out further. Okay, next one here takes us to Thailand. This is over Bangkok, and this is three fast walkers. This is this interesting footage of a three fast unidentified flying object flying uh, across the sky above Bangkok in Thailand. It was reported on Sunday the 20th at 7.45 p.m. All right, here we go. All right. Objects in question. You can see, by the way, they keep moving around that they're not just... Uh, a triangular pattern but independent. Alright, see him there moving across. Alright, the link's available so you can check it out. Moving on. From there we're going to go over to Los Angeles. It says a witness has reported from San Fernando Valley just outside of LA that he has photographed strange saucer shaped craft flying above the LAPD helicopter while taking some test photographs. Alright, uh, here's an image. I said the witness was in his backyard manipulating the shutter speed of his camera attempting to capture the rotating blades of the helicopter. I had set the camera to shutter speed of 1 25th of a second in an attempt to catch the rotors of the LAPD helicopter, but the photo photographer did not the photographer did not have a chance to look close in the photo until December last year. All right, so this is an older picture, but nonetheless, something recently just coming out. Okay, moving from there. Now we have a UFO over at the inauguration yesterday. Let's see what happened. Okay. What we're looking for here is object in question. I don't believe that's it there. There we go. It's our object in question showing up up there. Quick appearance just to show you what that was. All right. Okay, we're going to see it right in this area here. It's going to blink on momentarily. There it is. So, what do you think that is? I don't know. But check it out, check it out, check it out. All right, uh, this is a story. Statements from the leading UFO skeptic in the world. There are several researchers and believers out there who devote themselves to UFO sightings, but no one could ever imagine how Philip J. Kloss spends almost all of his life on ufology and extraterrestrials. A graduate of Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, which he finished at Iowa State in 1941, Kloss has been continuing 
his research on an identified flying object even at age 80. He was still working more than 40 hours every work to, week to study UFO cases and other UFO matters. He did not mind responding to reports even if it comes from distant lands such as Russia or India. Klaus shared that he conducted his first ever major examination of a UFO case in Socorro, New Mexico in 66. It was about an unknown flying object with the shape of an egg that landed in the area. However, he also pointed out that one of the interesting cases about aliens he investigated was a UFO phone case wherein a glowing object looked like plasma was photographed by a teenager named James Lucy. The event was recounted in his book, UFOs Identified. Moreover, Kloss recalled the case that in New Zealand in 78 was what he considers at the most time-consuming case ever investigated. He explains that this case drew a lot of attention. Even the media coverage was involved because of the video footage of the several diverse UFOs in the country. When asked about the unforgettable 1947 Roswell case, Kloss believed that book authors made some editing to help the government hide the truth behind the claimed crash of a UFO in the area wherein the dead bodies of aliens were recovered by the military. So it's a good article. You've heard his name before in uh, UFO circles because he's certainly been out there. And Anyway, moving on, check it out on your own. And his very last one here, this is a good piece. And play this, get this started. This is um, a video of different shots coming off of the II. S, International Space Station, or ISS, excuse me, and you've seen a lot of these because we've been showing the ISS and the images, but here's a nice good compilation. It's a three minute long piece where you can see objects moving. Obviously good size objects to be able to see them like this. Okay. Another one. All right. We got one there. We got one there. All right. There you go. So I'm going to leave the video for you so you can check it out. I'll be back momentarily. Stay tuned. Got more news. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth. Continuing on, continuing on, we're going to start uh, this next segment off with three-minute news from suspicious observers. Always good reports. Here we go. Good morning, folks. Last week, as Mercury approached the Sun as one of three planetary alignments, along with some significant space weather we had here on Earth, we called a quake watch that saw the only six-pointer so far of 2013, albeit not a big one and without damage. This year's second quake watch was based on a coronal hole yesterday, and we had our second six-pointer, our first earthquake death as well in 2013. Hit 6.2, 6.1, even 6.3 on an auto reader. Third straight day of tremors near New Zealand as well, had a 5.8 strike off the east coast of Brazil. Yet another volcano in New Zealand with potentially explosive eruptions imminent. A giant wave impact took out a few boats in the Philippines. Leaking safety valve at the Pilgrim nuclear plant caused a shutdown, and a 5-inch drum labeled radioactive material has been found in a park in Scotland. Two tropical cyclones here, Oswald and Gary. The Australian north coast just has to ride this one out as it fades. Gary is gaining some impressive strength, but stumbling into the South Pacific where there's just about nothing to hit. Cosmic rays are within normal limits, now slightly rising at the end. 
Solar wind shows calming of space weather conditions as density and speed fall in the orange and yellow. The lack of flaring continues. The sun is quiet again. I thought we had a chance to see this change as to my shock and amazement a little sunspot group was born on the earth-facing disk. And now that the litany of spots from early last week is gone, he's kind of our only hope for atmospheric expansion at the moment. It's still doing the bipolar spreading. Yesterday saw more red negative in the trailing spot, however, which caught my eye. But it's gone now. We do have a new little couple on the top left. She is going to grow some more, but she is heading for the western limb. We also have a new and hopefully growing region cresting the northeast. Here's the dark coronal hole subject of the current quake watch. To the left of it you can see a large plasma filament destabilize and eject from the corona. Expert watchers can note a north edge surface energetic event about four hours prior to the release of the filament. We'll take a look in a few different wavelengths here. It's easy to tell most of this went south and away from Earth, but did any of it at all come our way? You start with Stereo B, Earth off to the right in this picture. Now the northern edge of the eruption is clearly high enough to meet Earth's orbit, and it does continue to spread. Then you look dead on from Earth as the Soho Lasco C2. Look below how the lines shift to the right. They're pushed by the eruption. And on the top left, you can see how broadly this filament pushed coronal particles. I think this will very weakly impact Earth's magnetic shield. We still have the wind stream pouring from the coronal hole about four days away. Below it, we have yet another plasma filament. On the northern solar disk, the right side sees our one sunspot group getting its act together, and on the left, a thin dark plasma filament leads ahead of that bright new active region cresting now. Draw a line through the south-central earth-facing coronal hole and you come out the backside north, likely through another coronal hole. Interesting. I'll leave you with a final glimpse and a long-term weather channel U.S. forecast. Eyes open. No fear. It's 6.20 a.m. Eastern Time and that's the news. Be safe, everyone. Alright, very good report. So, moving on from there. Uh, this is a video I don't know that you're supposed to see it. So if that's the case, I got to make sure you see it. This is a video that very recent and you hear talk about gun confiscation, but you're not supposed to know that it exists. Listen to this. And this might surprise you. Then again, maybe it might not. Here we go. And Joe, I have in my hands here uh, something that we received from the Senate, which is rejected Democrat proposals uh, in this gun bill. And I don't know that you've seen this or if you know that these are there or not. No, but we don't have our own list of rejected proposals okay. that the Senate rejected, so I don't have anything to show you. Okay. All right, so then I won't address it then if you haven't seen it. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. Uh, okay, thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Speaker, on the bill. And by the way, I would recommend not to have that list shared because it really has the capacity to uh, uh, dampen the enthusiasm to compromise. Well, it sure does when we talk about confiscation of assault weapons. It absolutely has the ability to dampen and compromise. Mr. Speaker, on the bill. Okay, so what you heard there was an actual event that took place in Washington or in a in Washington, New York, where they are actually discussing and have discussed gun confiscation. So regardless of what you're being told, they've actually discussed it, and at that point in time they had turned it down, but nonetheless it doesn't mean it's off the table and it's out of mind. Somebody brought it up. Somebody thought about that there. That should be the troubling part. Not that it uh, didn't pass, but that somebody actually presented the idea. Because this idea is something that you've heard people, alternative media, talking about for a long while. That this is a reality. And people would deny that it exists. Oh no, they're not going to take our guns. There it is. They have put that on the table. Somebody has already posed that idea. The thing that others say will not happen has already been posed. So there's someone out there is thinking about that. Don't put anything past these characters and these clowns in Washington and in office around this country because they're really not out to do you Americans any favor. They're not. And if they are, please let me know because I'll be the first one to, to say that I was wrong. But 
doesn't appear to be that they want to really help the American people, at least a good portion of them. Now, part of our problem we have in the world is not only our politicians, but we have media, which has its own particular agenda as well. And one of the worst, worst violators of this has, has to be Fox News and Rupert Murdoch. And for years, there have been reports coming out from a variety of sources, from insiders who used to work at Fox to those who've been researching about all of the unscrupulous activities that Fox News does. And despite that, there's still people all around the country who don't want to listen to that. They don't want to believe it. They believe, right, would rather turn a blind eye. Well, here is Rupert Murdoch himself admitting to the very thing people have accused him of doing. Listen to this. Is there any agenda that you want to shape? <laughs> no, not at all. I, I mean, I think that um, we don't have the power to change it. We, we, obviously, if you're in media and you're concerned with what's going on in the world, you'd like to make a difference by putting forward your opinions. Um, but um, you're not going to change the world completely by that. And I think we, can, we can't change elections. Uh, I think good, strong news organizations can, by disclosing things, can help shape the agenda, but only in a limited way. For example, take the war. Uh, has, I'm not just talking about the United States, but in terms of you having a global media enterprise, I mean, have you shaped that agenda at all in terms of perceptions of the war, in terms of how the war is viewed? No, I didn't think so. I mean, yeah. we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> tried in what way? <laughs> well, we basically supported yeah. uh, our papers and our television. I would say supported uh, the Bush policy right. in the Middle East. We've been very critical of its execution. Um, but um, it, our support hasn't meant very yeah. much because clearly public opinion now has grown very, very tired of the whole enterprise. Okay, so there you have it. So, media mogul there telling you they have tried it. Now, do you think they've stopped trying it? We know the stories about Ru Mur Rupert Murdoch and him and his son and all the lying they did to Parliament. So, they obviously didn't stop whatever they were doing over there and they lied to Parliament. They were brought back on multiple occasions. First time they lied, I watched these events. First time they lied in Parliament, asked the son James about if he, did he lie to them, and they said, oh no, he was honest. So then they came back later, and Parliament found out that what he said last time was a lie, and they called him on it. They said, James, we asked you if you had lied to us, and you told us you hadn't, but in fact, you had. So what's wrong with that? So they got some big problems going on. But now that they've had all their problems there and Americans don't pay attention to what goes on overseas and around the world, now Rupert Murdoch wants to really get his, fi his fingers into some more mess over here. He wants to take over the Chicago newspaper, Chicago Tribune, I believe, and uh, the LA Times. So he wants to expand his reach. So very important that we understand where media is coming from and what these media moguls really have in mind. What they don't have in mind is your best interests, because if they did, they wouldn't be trying to push their own agendas. Now, we're going to switch gears here to Obama. This is a story that should be of concern to every American. The Obama administration is quietly allowing China to acquire major ownership interests in oil and natural re gas resources across the U.S., the decision to allow China to compete for U.S. oil and natural gas resources appears to stem from a need to keep Beijing economically interested in lending the U.S. lending to the U.S. The Obama administration has run one trillion dollar plus annual federal budget deficits since taking office that likely will continue into the second term, allowing China to have equal equity interest in the U.S. energy production is a reversal of the Bush administration's policy. 2005, the Bush administration blocked China on grounds of national security from an $18.4 billion deal to purchase California-based Unical Corporation. As WND reported Monday, Beijing has been developing a proposal in which real estate on American soil owned by China 
would be set up as development zones to establish Chinese-owned businesses and bring its citizens to the U.S. to work. So, you know, it's great that we have a country that is diverse, that allows opportunities for these communities to grow up where people can experience their culture over here in this country. But when it starts to get to a point where other countries are coming in and our rights are being given away to them without people having anything to say about that, that's problematic. Now, why is all of these things going on? Well, one, it's because people have been very apathetic. People haven't paid attention for a long time, and now that they are, people don't know what to do about it. People are frustrated, so in their frustration, a lot of people just prefer to turn a blind eye. I'm not one of those, and I know you're not either, because if you were, you wouldn't be listening to this show or other shows of this nature. One of the problems we have in the world, and this may turn some of you off who are Barack Obama supporters, but one of the things, an issue we have is light versus dark, good versus evil. And there is a man in office, Barack Obama, who has been called out by a number of different organizations and individuals as possibly being the Antichrist or connected with the Antichrist, with that energy. Now we could say the whole of Washington fits into this category. But let's just, here's a few things. We've got the Antichrist. I'm going to play a piece for you of what Jesus had to say about him. He has a series of cars which the Secret Service called the Beast, a rel a, another connection to the Antichrist. We have these ugly scars upon his head that look like he had some sort of weird procedures or something going on. Not that that has anything to do with Antichrist, but there's something that's going on that hasn't been released to the public, what's, what's happened with him there. Um, we know about all of his lies, um, on and on and on. Last night at the ceremony that he had, Alicia Keys sang, and she sang a song in which she used the words, Obama's on fire. Obama walks on fire. Well, who would be on fire and walk on fire? And then she went on to say in the lyrics that Michelle and Barack rule the world. When did that happen? And why is Alicia Keys singing such nonsense? The other part of the problem is you have all of these performers, these musicians that are out there, actors, that have literally, by their own admission, sold their soul to the devil. Keisha, um, you've got uh, Nicki Minaj. You've got uh, what the girl that wears the meat outfits. I keep forgetting her name. It's not even important. Um, then you got Katy Perry. All of them. Yet all of these individuals who have outright claimed to be possessed are going to the White House. There should be some question about why Obama is surrounding himself with all of these dark spirits or those who claim to be possessed by dark spirits. It should be a question to every American, but it isn't. Because the devil is alive and well in the world. And the greatest trick the devil played was convincing people he did not exist. Well, we have a situation in office where a president is not acting the way a president should. And we need to pay attention on what sort of dark spirits are influencing him. Listen to this piece. You don't have to agree with it. But just pay attention, because one thing about this piece I know, that ever since I've been on this planet, people have said to listen to Jesus. They've also said to listen to the words of the Bible. This is information that's coming out of the Bible from Jesus. It's a translation. And you may say, oh, this translation is incorrect. Maybe. But there's one translation that says exactly what this video is about to show you. One translation. One translation is all it's needed to be correct. This is someone that Christians and Catholics and people of this planet have told we need to pay attention to, Jesus. Let's listen to this and listen. Open your ears and open your heart to really hear what this is and decide for yourself what is the reality of this. Okay? Here we go. Because this is serious business. This isn't something I don't think we should laugh at. I think we need to pay attention because if this is true, we got a problem. Here we go. Did Jesus really reveal the name of the Antichrist? I will report the facts. You can decide. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said these words. 
And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from the heavens. These words are written in Greek and translated to English. However, Jesus spoke these words originally in Aramaic, which is the most ancient form of Hebrew. As you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. If a modern Jewish rabbi were to speak these words of Jesus today, he would speak them in Hebrew, much the same way that Jesus would have spoken them. So in Hebrew, Jesus said that he saw Satan falling as lightning from the heights or from the heavens. So what are the words for lightning and heights or heavens in Hebrew? From the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, word number 1299, a primitive root word meaning to lighten or lightning or to cast forth, the word is barak. In the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, word number 1300, lightning or by analogy a gleam, a flashing sword, or a brightness or a glittering, the Hebrew word is barak. So lightning or a flash of light in Hebrew is pronounced barak or barak. Now consider this amazing fact. The book of Isaiah is the source of origin for the Christian concept and understanding of Satan, or Lucifer, as Isaiah calls him, in chapter 14, especially in verses 12 through 19. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, Lucifer, or Satan, is credited with these words, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In the verses of Isaiah that refer directly to Lucifer, several times it is mentioned that Satan has fallen from the heights or from the heavens. The Hebrew word used in this text for the heights from which Satan fell is Strong's Hebrew word 1116, pronounced Bama. Bama is most commonly used to refer to a high sacred place as well as to the heights of the heavens or the clouds. In Hebrew, the letter Wa is often transliterated as a U. Some scholars use the O for this transliteration. It is primarily used as a conjunction to join concepts together. So to join in Hebrew poetry the concept of lightning or barak and a high place like heaven or the heights of heaven, the letter U or sometimes O, the Hebrew letter Wa would be used. So barak O Bama or Barak U Bama in Hebrew poetry, similar to the style written in Isaiah, would translate literally as lightning and the heights or the heavens, or lightning from the heights of the skies or the heavens. The word Satan is Satan in Hebrew, a direct translation. So back to Jesus' prophecy in Luke chapter 10 verse 18 if spoken by a Jewish rabbi today influenced by the poetry of Isaiah he would say these words in Hebrew the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 10 verse 18 as and I saw Satan as Barak Obama did Jesus reveal to us the name of the Antichrist I report you decide. Let those with ears let them hear, and those with eyes let them see. One question I have, because I know that there's a lot, a lot of you out there who believe in Jesus. How much do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to dismiss this so easily, just because other non-believers say this isn't true? Or do you really think that there might be something to this? Because if this is the case, we got a problem. Now, it's not a problem that we can't fix, but we need to be aware. Is everybody going to be aware that there's a problem like this going on? No. So it's the responsibility of those who do understand what is going on to do something about it. Okay? So first step is awareness. Being aware of what's going on and the possibilities that exist. Anyway, I'm going to move on from there. All right. One of the things you've heard me talk about over the course of listening to the show is energy, that everything is energy. That's why at the beginning of every show, I do the sex section on cosmic um, weather. 
what is the energy we're dealing with because no matter where we go what we do energy is always around us now as we have moved forward in the December 21st we moved into a part of the galaxy into the solar system which is more heavily charged with energy and this is one of the things researchers are looking at now and understanding is true well the ancients seemed to have an understanding about this energy and they knew that as we crossed into this field it was going to affect our DNA and it was going to affect us in ways beyond what we normally are affected by energy we're going to be affected a little bit more so there's some real changes going on out there um, I know a lot of people think that December 21st came and went and we didn't have a world-changing experience and that's the end of it. It's not the case. December 21st, the door opened and we entered. We just are beginning, at the beginning part of a journey. A 26,000-year journey has just begun. A 26,000-year journey has ended not too long ago. So we're at this new beginning, experience a new type of energy field that we've crossed into. This is an article which is ad addresses that. It's at in5d.com. Uh, Lee Rannells is the author of this article. And it goes on to say, Astronomers using CSIRO's 210-foot Parkes Radio Telescope in Eastern Australia have found monstrous outflows of charged particles coming from the center of our galaxy. The researchers said that the outflows contain an extraordinary amount of energy reaching about a million times the energy of an exploding star. Although the outflows are shooting out at over 600 miles per second, they pose no danger to Earth or the solar system. They are not coming in our direction, but go up and down from the galactic plane. We are about 30,000 years away from galactic center in the plane. There is no danger to us. Okay. So, there is more to the article. I'm going to leave it for you. But, here's the idea they've understood that there's now energy coming out of there. They say that's not dangerous. Okay, The ancients said this was a transformative type of energy that we were going to experience. A lot of folks that said, oh, there's no change going on. Here's an article that shows that there is. So energy has shifted because we've moved into an, a highly charged place and we're moving closer and closer to that center point each and every day. Okay, so we shall experience more. You shall see. Now, continuing on with that idea of energy, I want to play a part of this piece. This is Suspicious Observers. And if you recall on the last video yesterday, he talked about a video he was making all about energy. This is this video. It's a 12-minute video. I'm going to play just a small portion of it. Leave the link available so you can watch the whole thing. But he is addressing exactly what I was just talking about this energy flux that is taking place so listen to this and uh, enjoy I am always suspicious when I only hear one side of any story. Our climate has changed throughout history and all evidence suggests it's happening again now. And finally, the loudest voices in the world have begun to offer more than just carbon emissions as an excuse for the shift. It's something I've suggested for a while and what follows is a review of the facts without the sensationalism behind which they are too often veiled. Make no mistake. Carbon dioxide, both man-made and natural, does play a role, along with methane and water vapor. The greenhouse gas correlation to temperature has been remarkable for hundreds of thousands of years. CO2, temperature, methane in blue, red, and green. We have recently seen an even more extreme increase in CO2, nearing 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. And on those longer time scales, it looks like this. 
and with the last few years temperature changing only slightly, we can say that the CO2 curve has officially deviated from the correlated temperature. Our longer term data, over hundreds of millions of years, is less certain, based on more guesses and different analysis. But our best guesses show that those greenhouse gas correlations have not held true over millions of years, and that right now, Earth has not yet hit the historic high temperature mark. Those pushing for a lone carbon causation like to show that the sun's energy is flatter over the same time period, and this is where the alternative hypothesis begins. First, the sun's energy absolutely does ebb and flow and has generally increased over the last 70 years, even if only slightly. NASA recently joined this discussion, forcefully asserting that slight solar variability can have drastic changes on the climate. Scientists are observing that this is one of the most influential climate forcing factors. Daily viewers in our community were set alight as they had heard this before. It's certainly not a new notion, but we are now gaining more of an understanding of how the sun and cosmic rays affect our climate, and we're learning the true power of energy from outer space. One aspect of this currently under dispute, as the mechanism for cosmic ray cloud formation is well understood, recent data present contradictory observations. This of course does not change the fact that they ionize the atmosphere and electrochemically destroy the ozone when oxygen and nitrogen square off. Keeping in mind the move towards space weather influence of the climate, the piece of the puzzle that gets almost no mention in the press is the one I consider most important. Earth's protective interface with energy from space, known as the magnetosphere. This is the visualization of it weakening over the last 400 years. Considering that this is well known in the scientific community, it's curious that we do not hear more about it, even as NASA finds it doing its Swiss cheese impression. Earth's magnetism changes in other ways as the pole shift you may have heard about has indeed begun. Over 73 years, the normal movement of the magnetic North Pole was slightly above average, but after that it began racing faster. 1904 to 1972 represents a shorter 68 year time period. Then it took that same large jump in less than 30 years. Again, the scientific community is well aware that it doesn't stop, not in 2005 and not in late 2010. There are not regular reliable updates on this and that needs to be fixed. The discovery article I usually cite here has been removed. That's a double-edged sword considering they try to blame CO2 in the subtitle. But CNN picked up the story along with many other outlets. NASA confirming that they do not understand the recent drop in our atmosphere. The reason I like the discovery article is because they are so close to the answer. They even say solar minimum shrinks the atmosphere. Well, the recent solar minimum started normally for a few years, but in 2007, the coronal holes began to leave their normal polar position and broke for lower latitudes. Then, the minimum known to shrink the atmosphere deepened to lower than it had in a long time, and it didn't stop, going even lower, and continued extra low levels beyond when the minimum was supposed to end. Solar maximum would normally expand the atmosphere, but the red line is expert predictions for the cycle, very low, and the actual sunspot numbers are clearly lower. Furthermore, the flaring from Earth-facing sunspots appears not to match the potential based on magnetic classification. It's more than just atmospheric collapse, it's over-ionization, too much energy taken in. This is one year of critical frequency readings of the F1 layer of the ionosphere near the end of the previous solar minimum that closed out the 1990s. This follows the solar cycle, so naturally it went up at the last maximum that kicked off the new millennium, came back down to start the solar minimum normally for a few years, but again, 2007 brought anomaly as the readings spiked despite the deep, prolonged minimum and continued far off the charts. For more serious students of these topics, the combined collapse and over-energetic state of the ionosphere and atmosphere may play a role in the recent explosion of noctilucent cloud sightings across the globe. Okay, so there's more to the article or more to the video. I would encourage you to check it out. But uh, definitely something interesting to, uh, to keep our eye on. Keep our eyes on the sky. 
You never know what's going to happen. Remember the uh, Fantastic Four? Remember how they got their powers? They were hit by this energy from the cosmos when they were out in space. So is there something going on? Is that an indication or a, a pre-advanced information about DNA change that's going on? That seems to be part of the story with this energetic shift that we're taking place. So we shall see how it all unfolds. All right, let's uh, do our meditation for today. So go ahead and close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath and exhale. Okay, today, let's imagine, first of all, let's activate all of our chakras from the bottom of the spine up. Red at the bottom of the spine. Imagine drawing energy from the earth into that lower chakra. And then from there, imagine the energy raising higher from that lower chakra to the chakra above it, which is at the belly button, and imagine the color orange. And raise the energy up higher, just below the rib cage. Imagine the color yellow. This is the chakra of your intellectual body. Then you move the energy up higher to the heart, right in the middle of the chest, and imagine the color green. This is the heart chakra, the center of love. And we send the energy up higher to the throat. Imagine the color blue. This is the center of our communication. Up to the third eye, imagine the color of violet, right between the two eyebrows. This is the center where we see through dimensions of space and time. And finally to the crown chakra, which is the top of your head. Imagine the color indigo, and then the light continues on into the cosmos as bright white. So honor your connection to the energy that flows down into you from the cosmos and up into you from the earth. Feel this energy as it blends together inside of you as it flows through all of your chakras this is your energy this is the energy that charges itself through your body each and every day feel this see the multicolored this of this energy and as it fills your body allow it to overflow and as it overflows, just let it fill the room that you are in. And take a moment to feel the energy flowing out of you into the room, the space around you. And then let the energy expand out further in all directions until the energy fills the neighborhood the city, the state, the country, across the sea, to all of the other countries around the world. Imagine each and every one taking time out to honor their connection to the energy of life. Let's just take from our heart chakra love, the color green, and let's just send this energy all around the world. Send love to each and every individual. And let's just think a thought, positive thought for the world today as we move forward. Positive thoughts. And while we allow our unconscious mind to continue to pump out positive thoughts and positive vibes through the rest of this day, let's bring our conscious mind back to the present moment on the count of three. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. Go ahead and open your eyes. There you have it. That is our show for today, my friends. Thanks for being here. Remember, it's all energy out there in the world. And we have an opportunity 
each and every day to utilize that energy in ways that will assist us or ways that will hurt us. The choice is ours. That's the free will choice that we have. So contemplate on using your energy and contemplate on the results from your energy. You know the difference. If you use your energy for good or if you use your energy for bad, pay attention to the way you're using it and you'll notice that there's always a result based on the way you use your energy. If you use it for good, good comes back. You use it for bad, bad comes back pretty simple system. Pay attention to that through the course of this day. That's it. Just pay attention to your energy and imagine and see what difference that makes in your life. Awareness is very important and that's a big one. I'll be back tomorrow with more news and information. Have an awesome day. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.